Innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity and not a threat. Those were the words of Steve Jobs, the late CEO of Apple, whose technology completely revolutionized the way we interact with mobile devices. Now, 2020 has been nothing if not a year of unprecedented changes. We've all learned to adapt. We've learned to work from home, to socialize at a distance. For those of you with kids, you've probably learned to juggle work with homeschooling. And it's posed a threat to businesses as well. The arts and entertainment sector has suffered. Many small businesses and high street stores have had to close down. Perhaps it's been a real challenge for your business too. But as I say, necessity is the mother of invention. And the pandemic has provided an urgent need. We need new solutions to fix these new problems. But what do these solutions look like? Well, that's what I'd like to talk about today. My name is Antonia Forster, and I'm a Unity Games and Demos developer at Ultraleap. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the things I've worked on and some of the different touchless technology that's available to try and help move forward and innovate in this strange new world that we're all navigating now. So first, we'll be exploring some different examples of touchless technology, some that you definitely will have seen before and others that perhaps you haven't. Then I'd like to take a deep dive into hand tracking and look at how it works and how we can combine that with haptics for really powerful experiences. After that, I'd like to look at practical use cases. What different applications does this have, perhaps at home or in industry? And after that, I'd like to talk about some of the challenges or opportunities that I've personally worked through trying to design and implement a completely new kind of interface. So first of all, what do we mean by touchless technology? What does that actually look like? For the purpose of this talk, when I say touchless technology, I'm talking about something where you don't have to make contact with any device, any controller, or have any wearables. Now, of course, those things are valid and interesting solutions themselves. They solve different kinds of problems. For example, in the top left here, we can see the Valve Index controllers with this knuckles design. Now, they actually allow hand tracking because they can detect where your fingers are. But because they're an actual device that you have to hold, I wouldn't count them as touchless. Similarly, this is a wearable device developed by Cornell University that goes around your wrist. So you don't make contact with a screen with your fingertip, but again, something is actually touching your, your arm. And then finally, we're seeing solutions being rolled out by banks to try and prevent people from touching the buttons on ATMs out in public, which poses a hygiene concern during a pandemic. So one solution is having the ATM menu on your phone. It's a really valid and interesting solution. Uh, but again, you are touching a device, you're touching your phone. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to include those as touchless technologies. So if those aren't touchless, then what is? Well, I would say there's four main types of touchless technologies that are coming into prominence or are ubiquitous already. Uh, the first is very simple, and you definitely will have interacted with it before. Simple presence detectors like motion controlled lights or automatic doors or taps. One thing we're seeing a lot here in the UK is automatic hand sanitizer dispensers in stores. Very useful, but the main drawback there is that they're very binary, they're very simple, so they can only really detect whether you're there or not and be active or inactive. You can't really use that to control a complex interface or give a number of different um, inputs. So another possible solution is face tracking and facial recognition. I, uh, Apple's flagship iPhone X does have face ID. So it will scan the user's face and use that biometric data to unlock the phone for the correct user. That's really interesting. And we're also seeing that kind of technology in airports. But people have some security concerns about that being used in potentially places like shopping malls. Um, another example would be voice recognition. So perfect for use in the home, whether that's um, Google or Alexa or Siri. But again, it has potential issues used in public spaces, partly because of security concerns over recording audio and also because it's difficult to use in a noisy environment where many people are talking at once. The final type of solution I'd like to look at in detail today is hand tracking. Now, of all of these different solutions, I think hand tracking has the most potential for use uh, in terms of complex interfaces in public spaces. And I'd like to dive into why. Hand tracking has massive application in public spaces because touch screens are already ubiquitous. We use them everywhere. And anywhere where we have a button or a touch screen in a public place, we could replace it with a touchless, completely contactless screen. 
It also has massive application in virtual and augmented reality, VR and AR, which together I'm going to describe as XR, because you can actually just reach out and grab things in a very natural and very intuitive way. There are a number of companies that have recognized the massive application for hand tracking, particularly in XR. And I would say there's three big solutions providers in this space. The first is Facebook, who have the Oculus product, and their Quest headset is an untethered VR HMD head-mounted device, which has inbuilt hand tracking. Another possible solution is HTC's Vive Cosmos headset, which also has hand tracking, but isn't as widely used or recognized by developers. And then the final solutions provider is Ultraleap. Now, Ultraleap aren't a specific manufacturer of headsets. Instead, they provide the hand tracking stack and have just announced a deal with Qualcomm, which means they are probably going to be included in lots of head mounted devices across the board in future. Ultraleap was created when Ultra Haptics, a company that makes haptic devices which allow you to feel objects in midair, merged with Leap Motion, who provide some of the world's most robust and best hand tracking. Uh, full disclosure, I work for Ultraleap, so of all of the different tech stacks here, that's the one I'm most familiar and the one I'm able to provide the most detail about. If you've been following the news to do with um, Facebook and Oculus, and also if you've noticed that Apple have recently acquired um, a VR firm called Spaces, who specialize in VR video conferencing, you, like me, are probably convinced that spatial computing is the future of digital interaction. So I'm really excited about the use of hand tracking in this space. So how does hand tracking actually work? As I said, each of these different pipelines has different solutions, uh, but I'm able to provide the most detail on the development pipeline for hand tracking with Ultraleap technology. So our hand tracking relies on this. This is the Leap Motion camera. It has two infrared sensors and an infrared light that flashes to illuminate your hand at 100 times every second. You can't see it because infrared is not detectable to the human eye, but the sensors can, and they capture that hand data. Now, its native software also has an inbuilt model of a hand, so it doesn't just detect where your surface is, but it can predict where the bones and the joints are, which means that if it can't see a finger because it's occluded, it can predict where that finger probably is based on the joints and position of your hand. This hand model and your movements are fed into the interaction engine, and that recognizes gestures like a pinch or a push, a swipe or a grab. And developers can easily use those in their games or applications in a number of different ways. Another thing you can do with this hand data is use it to create touchable uh, experiences or touchable objects in midair that aren't really there, which is called haptics. Haptics actually means any sense of touch feedback. So the rumble in a gaming controller or vibration from your phone when you press a button would also count as haptic feedback. The type I'd like to look at in detail, which I use, is haptic created with ultrasound. To create the sensation of touch, you need one of these. This is a haptic array or speaker. It's actually uh, an array of many transducers or miniature speakers that send out ultrasound. Ultrasound is too high pitched for the human ear to detect, so you can't actually hear it. And every transducer on this array can be individually controlled. If you emit ultrasound from just one transducer and you put your hand over it, you won't feel anything because the signal isn't strong enough. But we can use algorithms to fire every individual transducer with very specific time delays so that all the waves meet in the same point in space and time. When that happens, we get constructive interference, so the strength of all the waves adds up. This is called the focal point, the point where all the waves meet. Using the hand tracking that I just mentioned, we can put the focal point at any position on your hand. And that creates a vibration that you can actually feel. By moving this focal point around moment to moment, we can create different sensations. So maybe lines or shapes or even a hand scan or a 3D object. So if I created a haptic sphere, if you put your hand into the top of it, you'd feel a small circle. As you submerge your hand deeper into it, you'd feel a wider circle. And as you reach the bottom, you'd feel a smaller circle again. Um, if this was a, an in-person live demonstration, I'd love to invite someone up to feel an array and feel a haptic sensation and describe how it feels. But unfortunately, I can't do that as I'm delivering this remotely. However, if you were to ask me how it feels, I would describe it as a shape made of air or putting your hand through a ghost or a hologram because it doesn't provide any resistance, but you can discern the shape of something in quite some detail. 
Both hand tracking and haptics are incredibly cutting edge technologies, but what are the actual applications of this in our day-to-day -day lives or perhaps in industry? Well, I'd like to look at three different applications across three different industry verticals and show you some of the projects that I've personally been working on. Now, in some of these use cases, we include haptics, so you can feel what you're interacting with. And in some of these use cases, we just have hand tracking. So I'll explain for each one whether we do or don't. The three industries I'd like to look at are um, digital out of home, which means any digital device that's out in a public space, automotive, the car industry, and mixed reality, so VR and AR. Digital out of home means any digital buttons or display or device you're interacting with in a public setting. It could be something as simple as the buttons on an elevator or an ATM, or it could be a digital screen or information kiosk in a, a hospital or an airport or a hotel check-in, or perhaps uh, um, the self-checkout at a grocery store or um, buying food in a fast food restaurant. Now, in each of these cases, the buttons and screens that you're interacting with are touched by thousands of people every day, which poses a, a big hygiene concern, particularly during a pandemic. And consumers are more aware of that than ever. A recent consumer survey found that when asked to describe the top three benefits and drawbacks of touchscreens, people describe hygiene as the number one drawback. And only 11% of respondents said they thought that touchscreens were hygienic. The others responded with concerns. Um, as to lack of hygiene, and, and those concerns can lead to reluctance to interact, less purchasing, and also a stronger need for customer-facing staff to take orders and to help, uh, higher cleaning regimens to aid consumer confidence, and potentially negative brand associations. The most hygienic interface of all is the one where you don't touch anything. But what would that actually look like in practice? Well, I personally developed a bakery demo to show what it might look like uh, at a grocery store or bakery checkout. So I'll show you a short video of that now. As you can see in that demo, a touchless touchscreen works in exactly the same way as a regular touchscreen, except my finger remains about 30 centimeters away from the actual device surface. That completely eradicates any hygiene concerns and also instills confidence in the user. What I find most exciting is that we don't need very much specialist equipment at all. We don't need to go around replacing monitors or screens because that video is actually my hand and my computer in the video. It's just a normal monitor. It's actually not even a touchscreen device, just a regular computer monitor. All we need is a leap motion camera installed at the base facing upwards to capture the hand data. And then the actual touchless surface is purely virtual. So I find that incredibly exciting that these things can be converted with relatively low cost and it has massive implications. We've made a number of different demos to show different applications in the digital out home sector. So things like an elevator. I also developed um, an ATM, which is touchless, interactive movie posters. So we also have the potential to make things interactive that weren't before. Um, so I think this is a really exciting application and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in this industry in future. So we've looked at digital out of home. Next, I'd like to show you a little bit about how this can be used in automotive. The concerns of the automotive industry are very different. Safety is absolutely paramount. So the most important thing is that we make sure that our interfaces are intuitive to use and don't distract the driver so that they can keep their eyes on the road. I'll show you a quick video. This is just a section of a longer video to show you a demo that my team made uh, for use in an actual car so that the driver can just use gestures. Instead of fiddling with small buttons on a dashboard, we have a gesture area above the gear stick. You can swipe and pinch and move. And there's also some statistics about how this benefited the driver. So here's that video now. Thank you. 
Now, in that video, you can't see it, but the driver also gets um, haptic feedback. So the touchless screens we saw didn't have a haptic component, but this one did. There was a haptic array built into the car. And what that means is the user knows if the computer or the car recognized their gesture. So when they change the menu by opening their hand or they pinch and raise the temperature in the car or the volume, they also have that haptic feedback to confirm that their gesture was recognized. And the stats you saw overlaid on the video were from an award-winning 2018 study by Nottingham University, which found that it reduced the distractibility of the driver. More than a third of drivers were able to complete the tasks of changing the heating and the volume, things like that, without taking their eyes away from the road at all. Those that did take their eyes away from the road did so for less time, and they had three times as much accuracy compared with doing the same tasks on a touchscreen. So all of this adds up to more attention focused on the road and safer drivers, which is another fantastic application of this technology, not just in a pandemic, but any time. The automotive industry is also thinking about the future. So driverless cars are increasingly becoming closer and closer to a reality. And when that happens, we'll be passengers and we won't have to pay attention to the road at all. What will we do with that time? That leads me nicely into my next industry, XR. As I mentioned at the start of the talk, mixed reality or spatial computing is becoming increasingly important and hand tracking is such an integral part of that. When you're in virtual reality, by definition, you can't see the world around you. You can only see the virtual space. So if you're using controllers, you can't see them. You can only see their representation in the virtual world. And this can make it quite difficult to learn how to use controllers, particularly for someone who isn't a video gamer and therefore maybe has less exposure to things like controller input. That's really important when we think about the industry applications of this technology in particular. In contrast, when someone's put into VR, the first thing they do is reach out with their hands. It's very intuitive and it's universally accessible across cultures and backgrounds, regardless of someone else's previous exposure to controllers. So I think the use of your actual hands in VR not only is incredibly powerful and it's more accessible, but it also makes it feel more immersive when you're able to physically interact with your environment. It's a really incredible experience in virtual reality. In contrast to virtual reality, in augmented reality, you can see the world around you, but with things overlaid or augmented on top. So this can also happen on your phone. Technically, a Snapchat filter is augmented reality. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm really talking about head-mounted devices or HMDs um, with which you can do augmented reality. So these have transparent screens. And so you can see through and see the real world and, and you can see your hands. So in AR, it's paramount that we have hand tracking because it feels very unnatural to see your hands and see the world around you but not be able to interact with them. This is, as I said with VR, especially important when we think about industry application. Increasingly, we're seeing architects, designers, uh, medical professionals, and people from all kinds of different industries using virtual reality and augmented reality for a number of different things, either to design or to visualize or also for training. Training, particularly in VR, is very common now. So uh, particularly for things that are too expensive or dangerous to train someone on in real life. So perhaps training a construction worker operating heavy machinery or a pilot about how to fly a plane or a helicopter or perhaps a medical professional learning heart surgery. Now, as you can see from these images, to do that, we need extremely specialized controllers, which can be expensive and have to be custom made for the specific application, which isn't very practical. But if we have hand tracking, we can just mock up these controllers in VR, which is much cheaper. And there's a number of other benefits because no controllers means, as I said, less cost, hygiene benefits, no need for batteries, less peripherals to um, keep track of. And it's not just that you can model real controllers, so maybe a scalpel for a surgeon or a, a cockpit for a pilot, but you can also create controls that aren't possible in real life. You could resize windows with your hand or swipe them like in Minority Report. So I'd like to show you a demo in which we do exactly that. This is a demo that is intended for um, the person sitting in a back seat of a driverless car. So in contrast to the automotive demo, which you saw a moment ago, this is not intended for a driver, but someone in a virtual reality headset sat inside a driverless car. But it doesn't have to be a based in a driverless car. It's a shopping and social media experience. So you could imagine someone engaging in this in their home. You could use the same interfaces for gaming or perhaps uh, a shopping experience in a mall. So it has a really wide range of applications. Here's that video now.
Now, that video also had haptic feedback for the user, so you could see they were using a, a shopping wheel, I guess, to look at different products and place them in the basket, and they would get haptic feedback to confirm that they'd done so. The end of that experience, which you saw briefly, is almost a meditative experience. You control these particles, they change color, and you also get haptic feedback when doing that. It's a really fantastic experience. If this was a live demo, I'd love to invite someone up to try it, but it's a, a real joy to see it being used in this way. So we've looked at some of the different applications of hand tracking, from use in training in industry to um, less distraction for drivers in automotive to shopping experiences or different kinds of interfaces that could be used in gaming. Now I'd like to talk about some of the challenges or opportunities that I faced trying to design a completely new kind of interface. For me personally, as a developer, the biggest challenge isn't in the technical implementation because there's actually lots of documentation online and getting access to the gestures and putting them into your, um, your application is not the hardest part of this. It's in, I think the difficult part is figuring out how to engage the user in something they probably have no experience of, because this is a very, very new emerging technology. So the first challenge, I think, is to find the most appropriate mode of interaction. Obviously, with a touchless touchscreen, uh, there's only a couple of different modes of interaction. You could pinch the buttons or push them. But when it comes to virtual reality, there's a lot of different ways that the user could engage. So I'm going to look at just three of them. Then you have to decide on the most appropriate way to present your user interface or your UI. Again, on a screen, there's only really one option. You present it on the screen. But in virtual reality, there's many ways you could position the interface for the user. And so that's a really important consideration. The next thing is, how do you capture and retain the user's attention? So in virtual reality or augmented reality, how do you control where the user is looking or moving? Because they, can, they have six degrees of freedom. They can move in three dimensions and look in another three as well. So how do you capture their attention? And for a touchless screen, how do you grab the attention of passers-by and let them know that this is interactive and also not to actually contact the surface? And then finally, once you have and you've got their attention, how do you teach them how to actually use the technology, given that most people will not have experience of this before? How do you tell them that this is touchless and where to put their hand and perhaps which gestures to use? The first method of engagement that I'd like to talk about in virtual reality is direct manipulation. That means directly reaching out, grabbing objects and interacting with them in the way that you might expect in the real world. The obvious benefit of this is it's very intuitive and most users don't need any training in order to do this. But the downside of it is it works best on a larger scale, uh, less so with things that are tiny. So typing on a VR keyboard, for example, is kind of tiring because usually they're much bigger rather than being a regular size. You're usually poking buttons that are quite large and spaced apart, which can get tiring if you're inputting a very long uh, string of letters. So there are upsides and downsides. It really depends on your application. Another option is using hand raise, and this is an example from Microsoft's Mixed Reality Toolkit for AR and VR. You can see that you can use hand raise or uh, beams from a controller or from your hand. And so traveling in VR is often done this way. You often use your hand or a controller to point to where you want to go and press it to prevent the user from moving around too much in real space. You can also use hand raise for typing, for example, to point at the button you want and then, for example, pinch or press a button on the controller to select the button which is a, another interesting application. And the final input method I'd like to talk about is gesture recognition. Now, this is actually a clip from Google's uh, gesture recognition and hand tracking pipeline, which I didn't mention as one of the big three providers at the beginning because it's very rarely used by developers. And this is actually done on a phone. The benefit of gestures is you can have uh, a fairly wide range of different gestures that mean different things. Uh, but the problem with this is that the user has to remember which gesture does what. So it's usually used in combination. For example, I mentioned hand raise. If you're pointing somewhere and then you have a gesture like pinching, usually these modes of interaction work best uh, when they're combined rather than relying on gestures alone. So those are the different modes of interaction. And once you've decided on which one you're going to use to actually navigate your UI, you have to decide how are we going to represent this user interface to the user. So as I said, on a touchless screen, this is fairly intuitive. You just show it in screen space. But in virtual reality or augmented reality, you have a number of different options. The first is screen space. Or in VR, this would be called a HUD or a head-up display. Now, 
I find that a bit jarring personally because it means that it follows the user. So it's a little bit like having a button or text on the inside of a, a helmet or against your eye. Um, it can be useful for certain things. So it's a little bit like a Terminator overlay on the world or an Iron Man style um, helmet user interface. So I think in the right application, it can be appropriate, but largely I don't tend to use this very much in virtual reality. Your second option in terms of representing the UI to the user is doing it in avatar space, by which I mean attaching it to the hand, like in this image. Now, if you want the user to be able to use both hands, you can have the menu activate when the user flips the hand over. That's a very common mode, uh, method of in activating the menu. Uh, personally, I quite like this method. I think users find it fairly intuitive. They do usually have to be trained in how to do this. But once they do, it means the menu is always with them wherever they go in virtual space. So that can be quite a useful one too. Thirdly, you can put the menus in world space. In this image, you can see that being used in combination with avatar space. So the user is taking the menu out of their hand or avatar space and placing it in world space. And once they do, they can move around it, they can change where they look and walk, and it will remain in that stationary position in their virtual world. This is very useful, for example, if you're training a user on a piece of machinery or you're giving them a tour around a virtual building or factory, because you can use the interface like a menu attached to a specific place in the world and the user can come up to it, interact with it and walk away from it like a screen in the real world. Finally, you could put your user interface in object space. This is a little bit like world space, expect, except it's anchored to a specific object. And this is quite useful if you want users to move objects around, but you want a label or an instruction to remain attached to that object. So this is an augmented reality example from the mixed reality toolkit. So each of these are options. And what I would say is there's no universal answer. Think about what problem you're trying to solve with your application and which type of user interface will be most intuitive and most appropriate for your use case for your specific audience. So now you've decided on your interaction and you've decided on how you're going to represent your UI. The next question is, how are you going to grab and retain your user's attention? In virtual reality, the user can move or look anywhere they want. So one common way of doing this in VR is to use audio cues. Because if you hear a sound behind you, it's really hard to resist turning around to see what it is. We can also put dashed lines or uh, arrows pointing to where we want the user to look. A little bit on the nose, but it can be appropriate and it usually works. Now, for a, a virtual screen, like a touchless touch, sorry, a physical screen, like a touchless touch screen, how would you grab a passerby's attention, especially if they're not expecting that screen to be interactive? That's a really interesting challenge that we've been working on. Uh, so one way to do it is to have signage either next to the screen or text on the screen, but people don't tend to read signage. And that's across the board, not just in terms of uh, movie posters, but regardless of, of the installation or the application. Uh, so one, another, another method that we've tried is putting footprints on the floor uh, in front of the device to indicate that the user should stand there and interact with it. That works fairly well. And once a user is standing in front of a monitor and interacting with it, that attracts other users. And that seems to be extremely effective. It's called the honeypot effect. If you want to achieve that honeypot effect and get that first user interacting, you have to think very carefully about the placement of your installation in physical space, where it is in the, the mall or the physical setting that you've installed it. So now that you've got the user's attention, how do you train them in terms of how they actually interact with the application? In virtual reality, if you're using direct manipulation, it's very easy to train users in how to respond because they're physically moving objects around the space. But in something like a touchless screen or gesture recognition, perhaps in uh, automotive, as we saw in our demo, it's much more challenging. How do you teach them gestures? Well, one way we've done it is by using animations of hands on the screen. And for automotive, this works very well because the user's attention is already on that screen. You're not trying to grab the attention of a passerby. We use animations of hands and the user copies it to do simple gestures like pinching, rising, uh, lowering, and perhaps opening and closing the hand. One of the keys for gestures is not to teach too many and also to keep it fairly simple. Once the user's been taught, they can continue to use it throughout the demo. So a naive user is the, the most challenging one to teach. Once they have it, you can continue to use that throughout. Again, I'll give the caveat that 
there's no un universal answer for this. The most important thing is that you test out different modes of interaction, different types of UI, different gestures and ways of grabbing attention and teaching the user, and you actually conduct user testing. So please don't take any of what I'm saying as finalized gospel. We're constantly learning and experimenting because this is a completely emerging space. There's a lot left to learn. And I think that's incredibly exciting. So conduct user testing and think very carefully about what's most appropriate for your individual application, which nearly brings me to the end of my talk. We've looked at what touchless technology solutions really are. We've taken a deep dive into how hand tracking works and how that can be combined with haptics for really powerful effects. We've looked at applications in industry, from digital out of home to automotive, to the very bleeding edge of mixed reality. I've shared some of the challenges and opportunities of working in such an emerging space and designing these completely new kinds of interactions and interfaces. But if you take one thing away from this talk, I want it to be the quote that I shared at the beginning. Innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity and not a threat. In these ever-changing times, we need innovation more than ever. To solve problems we've never seen before, we need solutions that we've never imagined. This is the beginning of a new age of technology, and I'm really excited to see what innovations come next. Thank you so much. I have uh, time for a 15-minute Q&A now, so uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. We'll put through as, as much of our... Uh our small audience as we can. Um, so that was a really fantastic talk. We're going to see, presumably, Antonio up on the screen in a second. Still got slides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I am here. Hi, Antonio. Welcome to the hi. conference in person. Uh, thank you for that fantastic video. Uh, as I said at the start, this is a topic that I've always been fascinated by and watched with great interest. I guess to kick off the Q&A, um, you know, obviously this technology has been developing for quite a long time now and, and there's some really exciting examples of uses that you've talked about, but it hasn't quite made it out into the mainstream yet. I think sort of Pokemon Go was the widest spread that an EAR mm. really got. So what, what do you think is going to be the sort of killer app that actually really brings this into the mainstream? That's a very good question. I uh, actually, as a video gamer, it pains me to say this, but I don't think it will be video games because I think that's a very specific demographic. Um, I think the thing that normalizes it will be something like consumer application. So using it um, for shopping, for example, because it's just, uh, it just engages with a much wider demographic of people. Um, virtual reality is different. So with augmented reality, I think um, shopping apps and um, the touch -to touch screens especially, I think there's a really ubiquitous range of, of applications that I went into um, in the talk. But with virtual reality, I think it may be something like um, video conferencing. So I mentioned briefly in the talk that Apple have um, bought the VR firm called Spaces that specialize in video conferencing. Um, and Oculus recently have announced that the, um, yes, well, Facebook, sorry, have announced that the Oculus headsets will be integrated with Facebook. Um, so I think social media and uh, video conferencing and connection and networking is what's going to drive virtual reality. Um, and I think the consumer shopping experience might be one of the things uh, that's going to drive augmented reality. Great. So there has been quite a few questions coming in and you've been hot on the buttons answering them. So I'm just trying to look for which was the ones you haven't answered. I think, though, it would be interesting because you had a really good chat with Paula in the chat about accessibility. So it'd be great for anyone who hasn't sort of read through, if you could talk a little bit about accessibility challenges for touchless technology. Definitely, yes. So one of the things Paula brought up, which is a very good point, is that for someone with Parkinson's, they might have different mobility challenges. Um, and one of the interesting and challenging things about accessibility is that every user is going to have um, different accessibility challenges and different ways that the input is most appropriate for them. So you really can't design um, one catch-all solution. The ideal really is to have applications that can accept a range of different inputs. So if you have a screen that can be touched, can also be touchless, can also be operated with um, a mouse keyboard, uh, and can also accept voice recognition, that would be accessible to a very wide uh, number of users. Um, so that, that's really the ideal. Obviously, that's sort of more challenging to develop, 
Um, but most of the applications that I showed um, in that talk, so the bakery one, which I personally developed, it can accept touch input, touchless input, and uh, mouse keyboard input. So it's already got sort of three of the four. Um, I've personally not integrated voice recognition with any applications, but it would be something that would be doable. And uh, in that case, it would be accessible for a wide range of users. Um, yeah, it, it is challenging because really, in order to develop these applications, we sort of have to position the camera somewhere. And it's tricky to develop hand tracking solutions without knowing where the field of view or the point of view is. Mm -hmm. So for a virtual reality um, use case, we'd have the camera mounted on the headset. I actually have a sort of um, camera that's separate to my headset and I just attach it on with Velcro. Um, <laughs> sometimes low tech solutions work. And uh, then it's, it's tracking the hand from this sort of um, perspective. But for something like a touchless screen, the camera's on the base of the screen. And so it's hand tracking from uh, down up. And we really have to know that in order to actually program the application effectively. Um, so having a customizable camera position would be something that isn't maybe very easily achievable, but having a wide range of inputs is something that is doable. Great, so uh, next uh, question is from our own Jacob. So have you seen any issues with people having to unlearn existing behaviors? For example, I remember seeing someone try to use a VR app on an iPad and trying to swipe and pinch Zoom. Yeah, I've um, tried to pinch uh, reading a book because <laughs> I normally read Kindle. Um, so yeah, you, you really do, even as a kind of very tech literate user, you do really get ingrained behaviors and you have to let them go. So the place in which we're seeing this very strongly is touchless touchscreens because we're so used to digital displays that we just engage with that it's really been a challenge to communicate to the user, you don't have to touch this. Um, Pre-pandemic, really, we thought there's going to have to be some kind of like cataclysmic event that's going to like teach people not to touch surfaces. And actually, it sort of looks like the pandemic may be that event. We are changing our behaviors quite drastically. We're learning to keep distance from people and not to contact things unnecessarily. So that actually could be part of what teaches people and, and changes their behavior significantly enough. Uh, in contrast, in virtual reality, people seem to engage very quickly with their hands. It depends on what the user interface is, but in that direct manipulation option, people intuitively understand that they can reach out and grab things and pull them and push them because it's so similar to real life. So it really depends on the specific application, but yes, we do have to teach people to unlearn behaviors and it is, it is very, very challenging. Yeah, I, I can't think of the number of kids I've seen trying to tap at just regular advert screens in shops and saying, Mummy, why, why doesn't it work? Um, so Tom says, uh, first of all, awesome talk and amazing concept. What kind of tolerances are available for users with something like Parkinson's or essential tremor, people who have issues using traditional touchscreen interfaces? Um, that's a good question. I don't personally feel um, qualified to answer that necessarily because the applications I'm developing, I'm, I'm specifically focused on touchless touchscreens um, within a certain demographic of users. So that's not something that I've personally explored a lot. Um, but I will say that the hand tracking on the Leap Motion camera, um, which is the one that I'm using at the moment um, from Ultraleap, so Leap Motion and Ultra Haptics Motion from Ultraleap. So we, we use the Leap Motion camera, it's one of our products. Um, it's very tolerant in terms of movement. So it can deal with occlusion, it can deal with uh, hand crossing, which a lot of other hand tracking solutions can't deal with. Um, and if a hand is tremoring, that's actually not going to invalidate the hand tracking. It will be able to, it can really detect like it's quite rapid hand movement. Um, so I would say in terms of the Parkinson's use case specifically, one of the challenges would be touching a button in three dimensional space. It's probably going to be more challenging than touching a button on, on two dimensional space. Um, so in that case, as I said, if we have applications that can accept touch or can be touchless, um, that's still an improvement on screens having to be touched because you're still drastically reducing the number of users that, that will be touching that screen. And you'd have to combine that with hygiene protocols and cleaning the screens as we are nowadays with kind of all our digital displays in public. Um, so yeah, I would say that it, it tremors would make, perhaps make it more difficult to achieve the correct kind of input. Um, but something like a gesture or gesture recognition might be more appropriate in that use case. So something like a swipe is quite a broad gesture and we can have quite a, a wide um, physical area in which the tracking occurs. So any kind of right to left swipe or left to right up to down um, would, be, would be very easily tracked even with um, tremors happening. So that might be more appropriate for that sort of use case. Great. Um, so next question comes from John Lewis, uh, who's saying the military have been developing and using some of these technologies for decades, especially for pilots. 
are they still leading in this field? Um, I have never worked on a military application. Um, Would you tell uh, us to the best had? of my knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I probably I probably wouldn't say if I had. Um, yeah, so to the best of my knowledge, actually, uh, there's a few fields and applications that we don't develop demos for, and one of them is military. So we've actually declined those sorts of opportunities. But it is true that the military is kind of spearheading a lot of technology. Um, for better or for worse, technology tends to develop where there's resource and where there's money. And my background is in scientific research, and it's also true in research, because where you can pour resources, you're going to get um, kind of quicker movement and, and more innovation. Um, so we are seeing uh, virtual reality, especially, being used for military application, for training um, pilots, um, also for commercial airlines and things like that, and medical professionals as well. So um, any field which is well-funded um, does result in a, a lot of innovation, but then that trickles to other industries as well and can have a lot of different benefits. Great. Um, comprehensive answer, despite <laughs> saying you don't work with them, so that's great. Um, so then Tom Connelly, Connelly says, uh, would BSL, so I assume that being British Sign Language, be an appropriate gestures set? What are the tech limits on available gestures? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is something I was looking into personally, just out of interest. It's not part of my role, but um, I was interested in, in virtual reality um, and full body tracking as well as hand tracking. So one of the limitations um, in virtual reality specifically is that you have the camera mounted on the headset, nearly all. I think all virtual reality hand tracking solutions, the hand tracking is achieved um, via the headset, the ones that, that don't have the controllers like the valve index, which I touched on at the beginning. That's, um, that's based on the controllers. Um, so there's a certain range or field of view. And if you have your hands, for example, under your chin, there's really no way that a camera would be able to, to track that. It would be occluded by your head. Um, and so BSL and ASL as well, um, pardon the sirens outside my, <laughs> my window, BSL and ASL involve um, the full body. So you have motions that are down at the hips, motions that are sort of at the chin level, at the face level, as well as further out. So something like finger spelling, we can um, track quite accurately and something I've, I've tried to do is just to see how many sort of um, finger spelling gestures I can, I can do in VR. They're hand tracked fairly well, particularly because we can, uh, we use a model of the hand so we can predict where the, the joints of the hands are. So if you have occlusion, which you have quite often in BSL characters, uh, we can still predict where the hand is even if we can't actually see it with the camera um, because we can see parts of the hand and infer the rest. But if you have gestures that are full body um, or involve movement of the body, um, that's not something that we can track just with hand tracking technology. So you'd have to look at something like full body tracking, which is a solution in VR. It does exist. Uh, it's more expensive and it involves more hardware. Um, but, but BSL users have actually been using VR and VR chat in particular um, to talk to each other. Uh, so it is something that's opened up. Um, what I don't know is how much um, sort of face tracking and lip reading is possible in virtual reality. That would be another thing that I know BSL and ASL users rely um, sometimes quite heavily on lip reading, and that's not something that uh, I know that there's very robust solutions for yet. Um, they probably are out there, I'm just not a specialist in, in face tracking. Um, yeah, so it's very interesting. There's a lot of different parts of the body that are used in sign language. It's not just the hands, and so I think we need kind of more holistic solutions to, to track all of that information. That's fascinating. So I'm going to read a comment from Paula just because it's, it's quite hilarious. Uh, she said, I know a business owner who, when computers first came in, used to put Tipex on the screen to collect, correct others' mistakes when going through the office at the end of the day. So that's a bit about learning new behaviours there. <laughs> so uh, next question, though, comes from Paul Smith. Are there any other forms of haptic feedback technologies emerging? Yes, so there are lots of um, haptic controllers. So haptics actually encompasses all sort of touch feedback. So your phone will often have haptic feedback when you press a button. You may not notice, it's usually very subtle, but when you press a, a keyboard on a virtual display, often the phone, if it's a mobile device, will vibrate very subtly. And that's actually haptic feedback to, to know that you, you have input a button correctly. Um, the rumble on a games controller is another example, which is, has been the case for a very long time, for decades we, we've had that sort of haptic feedback. And you can get whole um, HOTAS uh, chairs, so haptic chairs, there's haptic gloves and wearables, haptic suits, um, for some virtual reality experiences. Um, so ultrasound is not the only haptic solution, uh, but it is an entirely touchless haptic solution, whereas uh, all the others that I've seen have involved wearing something, holding something, sitting in something, um, that sort of thing, which means that it involves, um, in the case of like a chair, quite a lot of hardware. 
Um, so yeah, there are a number of different haptic solutions and I think they, you have to choose the specific solution that fits your use case. Um, so something like um, a ride, if you have to install a physical chair anyway, perhaps you want a haptic chair. We have these kind of 4D cinemas that have been around for a long time, which have chairs that vibrate and things like that. So different solutions will be applicable for uh, different use cases, but ultrasound really has a, a wide range of applications um, in terms of it being touchless and, and totally contactless. I think it's quite unique in that respect. Sounds like there's some major crimes going on, but <laughs> I live on a really busy road. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think I think one of the first sort of haptic devices that was out in, for the main market was the old rumble packs they used to have. I think was it for the N64 or something like that, where you'd <laughs> wear it to get some rumbling. So we have another question from Ashley Workman. Um, if multiple people are crowded around a screen within the touchless tracking area, does this cause issues with tracking? Is the engaged user still identified? That's a great question. Um, yes, it seems to be okay. Um, so the device can track two hands at once. It depends on what we have specifically programmed the application to do. So I've developed some applications where the user's encouraged to use both hands and some where it's encouraged to use one hand. Um, if your hand enters and then leaves and comes back, we recognize it as a new hand. So you could have users sort of rapidly change and that wouldn't be a problem. Um, if three hands are in range, as far as I know, it will only detect two and it will be the two closest to the camera. So you can have people standing in the background. That doesn't cause any issues. Even if they have their hands up, it's not particularly a problem. Uh, it would be a, uh, it would pose an issue if their hand was closer to the camera than yours. But in that scenario, presumably they're trying to use it. So it would, it would switch over to tracking their hand instead. Um, so yeah, it's actually very robust. It can deal with a lot of different light conditions, um, hands being present, people being present. Um, both indoors and outdoors. So yeah, it's um, very robust technology. So another question for me, you're, you've mentioned in the chat early on that you're moving to a new role with, with Unity. And yes. uh, for those who don't know Unity, a major piece of, of software that's really leading in all of these sort of building of spaces, building of virtual spaces. So I was looking at sort of VR when I was out in uh, Silicon Valley a few years back and looking at met with a really interesting company who were building animated stories, animated interactive VR stories. And they were talking about the challenges of storytelling in this world where you've got so much sort of, people could put their attention anywhere and if they can interact with things. What, what do you think is gonna happen with this sort of future of, of how we build stories and narratives and interactive paths once we've got sort of true immersive VR? It's a very good question. Um, it's really hard to predict where that will go because it depends on things like the global sort of climate and, and consumer demand. Um, so for example, I've always had the great belief that um, location specific virtual reality and augmented reality games would be huge. So if you imagine an escape room, but with augmented elements so put on a headset and we're interacting with both physical objects and virtual mm. objects, Personally, I think it's really cool. Um, I'm a big fan of things like uh, Secret Cinema, Punch Drunk, Immersive Theatre, um, and because I come from a, a storytelling and science innovation background. Um, so I would have vouched for location-specific VR and AR um, until very recently, but the pandemic has really hit those, those sort of experiences quite hard. Um, so it's difficult to predict what will happen. Uh, I do think that business applications will lead to very rapid innovations in the technology. Um, so specifically the role I'm going into is to be a mixed reality technical specialist for Unity, um, aimed primarily at the uh, AEC industry, so architecture, engineering, and construction. And those industries can use VR and AR to uh, visualize buildings and walk through them, including all their um, building information, um, things like the structural load on different parts. We can use it to design buildings uh, as well as experience them. And so I think those innovations will lead to leaps and bounds in technology and, and those leaps and bounds will be used for bigger and better and more immersive storytelling experiences. Um, six degrees of freedom, the ability to move in three dimensions and look in three dimensions is a huge design challenge for storytelling, I speak from experience. Getting the user's attention, directing it, uh, it really requires a, um, there's a real skill in it. You use lighting, sound, you could use something like arrows, but it's a bit on the nose. But um, I think game designers and immersive storytelling uh, designers have a lot of skills that will be relevant there. So, so yeah. people who work in theater have a really um, great idea of how to use lighting to direct attention. 
people who work in, in video game design have great ideas on how to use um, kind of set stage layout and um, sound to direct users. So there's a lot of transferable skills there. I'd love to see more people in the arts and culture sector um, moving into tech as advisors for those sorts of things that to design immersive experiences because I think that expertise is really necessary. Well, hopefully that maybe could provide another opportunity because it's a tough time for that sector at the moment. So perhaps sure. that's what we should be pushing for is, is new, new tech roles for the, the creative community. Um, so we've had another question from Tank Thunderbird. Um, adding to the previous question, do you know of any projects using Ultraleap to read not your but other people's hands, like the hands of a person standing in front of you that you might like to be interacting with. So I guess well, that's the idea that you could look at that person's hands and it would tell you some information? I don't know of any. That's an interesting point. Um, I think it would be technically feasible because when we have head-mounted uh, cameras, we're looking at the hand from the back. Um, so I think it would be technically feasible to sort of flip that model around and kind of track hands from the other side. Um, currently, that's not a sort of camera point of view that I think is kind of innately built in. We have two main ones, which are bottom up, so for touch and touch screens, and then in out for um, head mounted for your own hands. So I think it would require a little bit of pioneering of the tech to look for someone else's hands. I don't know of any applications of that yet, but it's a really interesting thought. So I think we have time for a few more questions if anyone wants to put them through on the chat. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, for me, I guess, Antonio, what would you suggest to people who maybe want to get started in, in this area? Where, where would they go first? What are some good resources or courses and things like that? Um, that's a very good question. So I actually taught myself um, to be a programmer. I used uh, Udemy and YouTube and Stack Overflow, basically. And I didn't have a background in coding and I decided to jump straight into virtual reality. I wanted to jump in at the deep end. But um, building virtual reality experiences, it is more challenging from a sort of design, as I said, things like lighting and capturing user attention point of view. But it's not necessarily more challenging to code a virtual reality experience than it is to code a kind of more traditional game. So I would say, even if you don't have a tech background, but particularly if you do have a tech background, don't be intimidated by VR and AR. There are amazing tools. Um, obviously, I vouch for Unity. <laughs> that's what I learned, and that's where I'm going to go work. Um, but yeah, Unity is free until you kind of reach a certain revenue stream. So you can get Unity Personal totally free. And there are Udemy courses, which are, I think I bought one for £10, which is by far the soundest investment I've ever made in my personal development. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's YouTube is absolutely replete with information. So for me personally, following a structured course and learning that way was the best way to get started. Once I had enough information, I decided to go off piste and start designing my own experiences. Um, and in terms of um, hand tracking, the main thing is to get your hands on a technology that you can use. Um, so the Oculus Quest is one option, um, and Ultraleap um, camera is another option, potentially HTC Vive, although it's less favored by developers. And if you can get your hands on that technology and then just try things out um, and search for solutions online and implement them and experiment and code and learn, then yeah, it will be well implemented. So, um, last one for me, and then we've got a question from Paula, is, is from your, you're also a passionate advocate, I see, of diversity and, and in tech, which is something that's very dear to my heart and to all the Tech Exeter community. So, could you maybe give us some thoughts about what you think we can do next to kind of bring more people from more diverse backgrounds into the tech sector? Definitely. Um, so one thing that I've often heard, so I consult as well in terms of diversity in tech, and I hear a lot of um, hiring departments saying, well, you know, we just look blind. We don't look at the name or the gender of the candidate. We base it purely on experience. But actually, choosing a candidate based on their previous experience really means you're choosing based on their previous access to opportunity. So it will filter out marginalized people because, for example, only 15% of computer science graduates are female. So if you necessitate having a computer science degree, I, for example, don't have a computer science degree. Um, and if I wasn't chosen based on my potential rather than my experience, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. 
So I think when you select candidates, it's really important to be open to people from diverse backgrounds with different experiences. Um, women notoriously are more reluctant to apply for roles that they don't feel they have 100% of the qualifications for, whereas men um, are more likely to apply when they have about 50%. Uh, women tend to apply when they're about 90, 100%. So if you list um, computer science degree, you will get fewer female applicants for the role, for example. So if it's not strictly necessary for the role, I'd really advise considering um, just putting on the things that you think are necessary. Um, there's also particular words that are used um, in hiring. So women are less likely to apply for roles that have the words um, lead, interestingly, um, competitive and assertive, but are more likely to apply for roles that use the words um, teamwork, reliable and collaborative, even if it's exactly the same role. So it's very useful to think carefully about the language you're using and the qualifications that you're listing as necessary, and whether they really are. Uh, if this is something that's interesting to you, particularly if you're in a hiring capacity or if you have a decision uh, making or executive role in your company, I'd really urge you to Google it. There are so many organizations and so many resources out there on this. Um, one of the best reports is one by UNESCO, which is called I'd Blush If I Could. And it talks not only about lack of diversity in the industry, but how that manifests in biases in our products. So one example is voice recognition software nowadays is seen as uh, assistive and sort of servile and unanimously has a uh, female voice by default, which is kind of the product of our um, implicit biases and the fact that we don't have very diverse teams building these products. So yeah, I, I definitely recommend looking up that UNESCO report. There's an organization called Lean In, which writes a lot about um, women in tech um, and looking for people with diverse backgrounds and hiring based on potential rather than experience. Yeah, I had a really interesting sort of answer to the question of, of blind recruitment from, um, there was a panel at a South by Southwest, which was all sort of senior women in tech talking about this topic. And one said, you know, if you considered these two people on the same ground level, you're ignoring the fact of how hard it might have been for one person to get to that same position. You know, if you're coming through with a privileged background where you already have the contacts and the the easy access to the university, the money for the high-level education, etc., then it doesn't diminish that you've done well, etc., but someone else might have started from far further back on the field and has to show a lot of tenacity and dedication to get just to the same point. You know, I always think of it about, you know, you look at who's first to the top of a mountain, but and you can look at that objectively, but maybe one person had all of the equipment and the Sherpas and all the money, and they got to the top first, and the other person had just, you know, bootstrapped together what they could and hardly had any support. And maybe the third person couldn't even start at the base of the mountain. They had to get there from much further away because they had no transport. So I think it's all about considering people within, their, within a context instead of a sort of obsession with taking people out of context. So we had a last question from Paula, um, who said she loves the idea of cross-fertilization from the arts and culture sector. How would they go about getting involved? Or is this something that the tech sector needs to invite in? So this is what we're talking about of could the creators come and have, have some more involvement? So maybe it's up to companies like, like Unity and Ultraleap to be starting to invite in those people and put those roles out there. What do you think? Definitely. I think there's there's lots of different ways this could happen. So it could be that the tech industry invites and makes space for kind of people from the artistic or um, culture and entertainment um, kind of community and sector. It could be the other way around. So, for example, as I said, I, I taught myself um, coding. I didn't really have a tech background. I was a communicator and public speaker. Um, so it's entirely possible for people in the arts, entertainment, culture sector, if they wanted to and if they're inclined to, to learn those skills, particularly if they have a burning story to tell and they know the medium in which they want to tell it, um, they could either absolutely reach out and find people who work in that industry, um, or they can find other artists who are themselves technical. There are a bunch of people, especially in virtual reality, um, creating these really incredible immersive experiences. And Twitter, I cannot recommend enough using Twitter to connect with people. Um, you'll meet just incredible people working on the fringes of different industries and, and merging these two industries together. So you can reach out and find others. You can teach the skills yourself. All third parties have quite a big opportunity to do that. So um, one of my previous places of work is um, a, a science and arts center combined in Bristol. And they really have um, a great position in terms of being able to, they have an exhibition space um, and they can invite both the artists and people working in tech to, um, to kind of collaborate and work together on uh, projects. So I think 
the arts sector could seek out the tech sector, vice versa, all third parties could kind of bring them together. Um, yeah, and it really depends. I, I, I think tech is unique in that, and particularly mixed reality, um, everyone who codes can use a computer, fairly obviously. So people put all their information online. And so you absolutely everything you need to learn how to use or code or create these technologies is online and largely free or inexpensive. Um, so if you're someone who feels that you're in the arts and culture sector and you'd like to create an immersive experience but you don't know how to go about it, like feel free to either reach out to people or start gaining those skills yourself if that's something you're inclined to do. Um, it's, it's absolutely available and it's out there. And um, if you are local or, or, well, it's virtual access now, we do have some great organisations um, and meetup groups here to the west of Bristol. Bristol's obviously fantastic for that sort of thing, but we've got fantastic groups here as well. We're today broadcasting live from Collider, which is a space that's really dedicated to that whole tie-up between uh, creative and technical. And there is Inact, which is another group uh, run jointly by Tech Exeter and Collider, which is the Exeter network for arts and creative technologists. So meetups have been on hold due to COVID, but they're due to resume. So um, watch that space. Someone may be able to post some more details in the chat on the event and, and keep an eye on all our sort of Slack channels, the Exeter um, calendar. But that's another fantastic group around here for anyone who wants to get, get more involved with that. There's also a, a talk coming up this afternoon from the Southwest Creative Technology Network, which is a funded program um, by a whole group of research institutions um, in the area who uh, are focusing on that and they've just closed for their data prototyping call. So there's some really fantastic things here and the great things that you've mentioned, Antonia, more widely available. So that, unfortunately, is all the time we have to chat, which is a shame because I've really enjoyed talking with you. Um, are you going to stick around to see some more talks? Or Yeah, I'll be around. Um, and if anyone had a question that I didn't get to, uh, please do email me or find me on Twitter. Um, if you Google my name, you'll find me. <laughs> Um, yeah, and if you get in touch, I'll absolutely make every effort to answer all the questions I can. But yeah, I'll be sticking around for some of the day and watching some of the amazing talks that are lined up. Great, thank you, Antonia. So, uh, next up is, is lunchtime and gaming. So, for anyone who wants to sort of stick around and have fun, Antonia's looking very excited about the gaming idea. We're going to have uh, an interactive game of Gespionage, which uh, we played at the Summer Social and was, was great fun. So, um, Join us for that. We've also got time for more networking, of course. You've got time to grab a bite and stop listening to us, if you prefer, if you need a break. And um, we'll be back on with our next two talks at 1.45, where we've got David Poulet talking about democratising computer vision with pluggable AI services in Azure. And our very own Jacob Tomlinson will be in a session in track two, doing an intro to GPU development in Python. So I think Chris is going to be telling you some more about yeah. about the gaming. Yeah, wave goodbye. And so we'll be going from here. Thanks, Antonia. Hi, thank you so much. Bye. <coughs>